going to turn on the recording um, and start here and say welcome to the first class of our spring 2021 ED615 class. I'm assuming you're seeing my slides, right? Um, if, if you just nod your heads and I know you're following along. Um, it's important to know that um, we welcome all races, all religions, all countries of origin, all sexual orientations, all genders. And we stand with you and know that you are safe here as part of this course and in general at CSU Monterey Bay. Um, as far as the logistics for this class, there'll always be an online agenda um, because I have three sections. Sometimes you'll see links to all of them. So it's important for you to remember that you all are section 82. Um, I'm getting better at remembering that. I probably will make mistakes and get my three sections mi mixed up, but I do appreciate you uh, letting me know uh, when I do in a gentle, kind way, of course. Um, so feel free to follow along. Um, and I just an FYI, in case you didn't know, you have your own Zoom accounts through CSU Monterey Bay. If you ever needed to use that for different group meetings, you can use that for anybody. You could use it to talk to your parents in New York if you wanted, but you know it's really there for our school use. So I wanna start our class today um, by honoring the native land that we're on. I'd like to acknowledge that this class at CSU Monterey Bay, if we were all there together, is being held on the traditional lands of the Costanoan people. And I pay my respect to the elders, both past and present. So I don't know how many workshops you've been in recently or groups where this happens, but it's a nice way to show visibility to native people who lived on these lands uh, before we were all here. So um, the links are in there on the slides to natives who inhabited this land, the Native American Resource Guide, where depending on where you live, it, it mentions that. So um, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, know that in this class, this is a safe space and it's a safe space to make mistakes, to take risks, to learn from each other. Um, some topics in this class may make you feel uncomfortable, but that's good because discomfort causes learning and it's important, especially in teaching history. In the same way, learning history can be uncomfortable for our students, not just us, but the other students. I'm um, The pink triangle, Anybody know what the pink triangle is a symbol for? You could type it in the chat if you want, or you can just grab a mic. I'm not seeing anybody. Uh, so in um, Nazi Germany, in the Holocaust camps, everybody who was in a camp um, had a symbol that they wore. And the pink triangle was a symbol of gay men. And so the pink triangle is also a symbol of safety and it's been reclaimed by the LGBTQ organi organizations and groups as a safe space to be who you are. So that's why I wanted to share that with you. The other thing I wanted to share with you is I want you all to know that you, you are America. And you are the ones who are teaching America's future leaders. Um, our students are impacted by your words and your actions every day. Um, and you know, as I talk to all of you and I've, as I've interacted with other students in the past, what I've learned is that education and going to school was not always empowering and accepting of all of you. Um, but I want you to know that you have the power to forget about that and make sure that your students feel safe, empowered, and that they are part of America. Um, because that, but that starts with how you feel about yourself and how you feel safe and how you feel empowered and how you feel to and being American. Um, and to those of you who have not felt safe in our schools in the past, or in some way you've been wounded, I want to apologize on behalf of our US education system because if you have been put down or not supported in who you are, that's just wrong. So I'm sorry if you've been treated that way. Our goal should be to make all of our schools safe, supportive, and inclusive of everyone. So as you begin your teaching careers, 
you have the opportunity to, to make that happen uh, and to leave those things in the past and move forward, which I hope you'll do. Um, in this class, I hope you will invite others in. So there'll be many times where you're gonna be meeting in groups. Um, and I hope that you'll invite those that don't often speak up to speak up so we hear their voices. It's important to hear all your voices, that we empower each other. It's not just for me to empower you, but it's okay for you to empower me and to empower each other, and that we're here to support each other. You know, this credential program is not a sprint. It's a marathon, um, and it doesn't have to be done by yourself because there's lots of people going through the same things you are and you can support each other. So I hope you'll keep that in mind as we move forward in this class. You have a number of CSU Monterey Bay support people, whether you know it or not. Um, but I just wanna remind you of that. Um, you have your class, classmates and I would ask you to think about who do you connect with in an ongoing way in this class or in the broader class, because again, it doesn't matter which section you're in, we're all doing similar things, but it's important for you not to feel by yourself out there. And if you are feeling by yourself, then I would encourage you to reach out to somebody else and you'll meet other people today in different groups that we're gonna do in a few minutes. So again, I would encourage you to include other people, make sure people are together, involved in things, knowing what's happening, because again, we can all be successful together. This is not a competition. Um, so I'm your support, part of your support team, your other course instructors are, you all have a, most of you have a clinical coach. Um, and then you also have a program advisor. And if you don't know who those people are, then um, let me know and I'll help you find them. Um, you also have an incredible education department support staff, Jean Harris and Gina Reynoso. Gina Reynoso, she knows everything about the department. So, you know, if you ever had a question, she'd be the one to email. Um, and then you, some of you have credential analysts and then I know many of you are doing EdTPA with Joanna Wong. So those are all your support people. Just keep in mind that there's lots of people and all you gotta do is reach out and we will provide whatever support within reason that you need. So if you haven't already, I want you to get organized. Um, and I know from my conversations with all of you that some of you are very organized and some of you honestly have said to me, I I'm really not that organized. Well, this semester you need to get organized because there's a lot on your plate. So, um, oh, so that's my first question to all of you. Do you know when the ed TPA, for those of you that are doing the ed TPA is due? Can somebody type, th type that in the chat room? Because if you don't know that date, then that is a key date that you better get on your calendars. Thank you, Myra. Okay, so does everybody agree that the due date for EdTPA is April 8th? For those that are doing it? How about a thumbs up or something so that uh, everybody else agrees with that? Or you can just agree with Myra. Okay. All right, so I want you to look at the class agenda now. And, and in fact, I'll switch to it um, to show it to you. So here's the class agenda that you should be seeing on my screen now. In this section right here, it says get organized. So what if you haven't done it already, I would open up this document here, the 82 assignments only document. and highlight all this stuff right here. Like I'm doing and copy it and put it into a Google Docs somewhere 
or if you're more of a print person, print it off, um, whatever it is. This one document will provide you the structure for all the assignments in this class. You can see all the due dates on the right. Um, as you'll hear me say over and over, I expect you to do all the assignments in this class. They don't necessarily have to be done by the due date, but I expect them to all get finished. So um, you can see some of the stuff highlighted in yellow. Um, again, just copy this, make a copy, open up your Google Drive in a Google Doc and paste it there and print it and put it somewhere on your refrigerator or bathroom mirror or wherever you look every day to keep yourself focused on what's going on in this class. Um, so then you have it. So I'm going to I'm going to wait a minute or two and, and let you get yourself organized with that. Um, let's see. The other thing is uh, OK, so the ed TPA is due April 8th. So I'm going to write that down here. Um, this doesn't impact you as much as it will my other sections, but on March 8th, which is a regular class session here, um, I have a special uh, panel that'll be talking about teaching about race, gender, privilege, and privilege in the K classroom. So that's a, a different date with kind of different things going on, but those are some of the key dates that you need to have written down. So. So I'll wait a couple of minutes just to, to make sure you get a chance to do all that. In fact, since I'm doing this pause right here, um, the second thing I want you to do right now, after you kind of get that stuff figured out, is um, we're going to play this game called Human Bingo. And at 4.30, it says Human Bingo, make a copy of this Human Bingo board. Um, go ahead and make a copy of that now. And I'll just pause so you get all that stuff figured out. So then we can go right into that game once we get to it. So we'll call this organizational time and make a copy of the Human Bingo board. It'll force you to make a copy, just put it in your drive somewhere. Or again, if you're more a print person, you want to print it off, you can do that. So I'll wait a couple more minutes just so people get things on their calendars, get your assignment list stuff figured out and make a copy of that human bingo board. So I hope you have, have clicked on at least those three links that are in the Get Organized section. I, want to, I, I showed you the assignment overview, but I also want to click on this assignment list. Because this assignment list has all the assignments in this course and all the details. Now, once you get into iLearn, it's all linked back to this page. But just know that all of your class stuff is all linked right here, all on one page. Um, I would not make a copy of this page, but you can make a link to it. Um, but all assignments, um, all exemplars of assignments, how to do these things, they're all listed on this page. So if at any point in this class, you get to an assignment and go, now what does he mean? Well, just make sure you go back to this page 
which I call my assignment index. Um, and you can see all the key things are listed at the top, the key links for each one of those sections. Again, your section 82. Um, so you'll always be listed la last on my schedule because it says section 82. I don't know why they did the schedule the way they did. I would have thought you would have been section 80, but they didn't. Um, anyway, so every one of these, if you click on the, any of these links, it gives you the, more of the details for each assignment. Uh, many of you have started working on the digital binder. The link here goes right to the same page that I sent you. So just know that those are all here as well. Okay, so again, I those three things, and then the EdTPA checklist from Dr. Wong is linked there as well. I'm hoping that most of you who are doing the EdTPA have seen that. Um, if it's new to you, well, put, you want to put that somewhere, so you pay attention to that as well. So those are the three three main things to help you keep organized in this class. All right, so. I'm going back to my slides now. And again, at any time, if there's questions or comments, um, just type them in the chat or grab your microphone. I'm going to make the assumption, if you don't say anything, you're all understanding all this, it's all making sense to you. So the other thing I've done through, and the other thing I want you to think about is, how are you going to remember the key things in this class? What are you going to, how are you going to do that? You know. Um, Many of the things we do in here will be more experiential and not, not much lecture. Um, I mean, I'll do a little talking each class, but more often than not, you'll be doing stuff in groups and we'll, we have a variety of activities that are scheduled, but how will you remember those things? Um, on my slides, when you see this note taking icon, this one in the center here, then that means that's me saying to you, you know, this is important stuff. So you need to remember this. It's not like I'm gonna give you a quiz or a test at some point, but it's just my way of saying to you, keep in mind that this is important. All right, so that's all the organizational stuff. Every time we meet, we're gonna have an agenda like this um, and there'll be a compelling question, which is the same compelling questions you see in iLearn. So our compelling question today is, you know, why is it important to get to know other people in this class? And why is it important for students to share their culture our objectives today are to get to know one another and to learn how this class is organized so that you can excel. And you can see kind of the blocks of time marked out there, which, which also um, parallel the agenda document as well. And then that takes us to our regular feature, which is inspirational food. And Henry and Eric are gonna share that. Let me click on their slides here and then I'll turn it over to them. So, whoops, let me get back up here. All right, Henry, you're first. And you tell me when to move. All right, perfect. Uh, good evening, everyone. For those that don't know, my name is Henry Lee. And for today's inspirational food, I'm going to be talking about pho. All right, next slide, please. All right, so for this assignment, we had to choose a quilt. And me, I love Marvel. Okay, and even though I love Marvel, this quote still I think pertains to a lot of us. You know, heroes are made by the path they chose. They choose not the powers they are graced with. Uh, the reason why I chose this was because, um, as teachers, right? You know, not everyone wants to be a teacher, but we chose to become a teacher. You know, for you know numerous reasons, and um, so it it kind of stuck with me. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the ingredients on how to make pho, it's a long process for those that ever tried or ate it before, you know, it takes about four to six hours. So the ingredients you need are beef neck bones, water, star anise, ginger, cinnamon, sugar, salt, fish sauce, onions, rice noodles, bean sprouts, brisket, and cilantro for garnish at the top. Now, how to make pho. So first, what you want to do is you want to place the beef bones and onions on a baking sheet and put it in the oven at 350 for about an hour or until it turns brown. That brings out the flavor. Most people just put it straight in a pot, but how you do it in Vietnam and the way my dad did it, this is a secret, okay? Now, while your beef bones and onions are charring up in the oven, 
take your star anise, your cinnamon, and put it on the frying pan, no oil, and just, you know, burn it a little bit because that also brings up uh, the flavor. Once that's all done, get a big pot, depending on how much you want to eat, and just fill it with water and put all the ingredients listed there. The charred bones and onions, the star anise, the, the cinnamon, salt, onion, fish sauce, ginger, and sugar, and just let it cook for four to six hours. And as it's cooking, just scrape out all the, the fat that will come from the beef bones and just throw it away. Once the broth is done, start boiling your rice noodles, slice up some brisket very thinly because then it cooks faster with the broth and just add everything to the bowl. You, know, you can put bean sprouts, cilantro, jalapenos, whatever you want. Um, but the secret that most people don't know is if you cook it yourself, the second day is always the best because mm -hmm. the flavors get to blend together more. And I always eat for like a week. My dad will always cook it and we have fun for a week. That's it. Erica. Hi everyone, this is Erica. Um, and I added this, well, it's inspiration and in food, um, but I also added this image that says, think positive, talk positive and feel positive. And I think this is important, especially um, for us since we're educators, like a lot of our students are going through a lot of difficult situations at home. Um, so just being positive with them and encouraging them, like it really helps them um, stay afloat during the day. Oh, next point. So for my food, I put the fruit salad. Um, so you will need about like for what I have on the pictures, it's something that I made here at home. So it's like eight strawberries, like 20 green grapes, blueberries. And then your steps are to first wash the grapes and put them first on the bowl. Um, second step, wash the strawberries. You cut off the top or is it also known as a calyx? Then cut the strawberries in half and place them in the bowl. Three, wash blueberries and add to the bowl and then four, enjoy. And then optional, you can add a yogurt or like different um, like little almond nuts and stuff like that, um, like trail mix. But this is what I make sometimes when I'm like feeling, I don't know, de-energized. And then it really helps to just um, boost my energy. And then for my inspirational quotes, I just put, um, you must tell yourself, no matter how hard it is or how hard it gets, I'm going to make it. Um, because one thing that I found out is that if you keep thinking like, oh, I'm not going to make it, oh, it's too hard, um, or I'm not going to have enough time to do this and do that, you're just bringing yourself down. And in my personal experience, I've always just like, even if I don't have something, I'll say, oh, it's okay, I'll get it later. Um, and it really helps to not make you feel down. Um, my next one is you are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. And I chose this one because I have friends who um, want to come back to school, but then um, will start college because they didn't start college after high school. And they say they're too old and they're not going to finish in time. And I tell them, you're never too old to start. So yeah, that's everything. Great. I want to thank Henry and, and Erica for stepping out and being the first ones to do this. That's always the hardest when you're the first. So that was great. All right. So the for those of you who are doing inspirational food, the next time um, know that I'll reach out to you ahead of time with an email just to tell you what, how to do it and that sort of thing. The people are my inspirational food people. I decided you're also my Zoom monitors. So as you see questions, um, let people in and that sort of thing. Know that as we move from week to week, there might be a whole bunch of you, but I just really need two Zoom monitors, a couple people who will just come to class like five minutes early just so I can make you a co-host. That way I've got somebody else letting people in, putting links in the chat and that sort of thing. So, um, so that's kind of the Zoom monitor thing. In Zoom in general, 
I don't know how you set up your, your screen, but this is how I set mine up. I've got on the left side of my main screen, everybody's photo and what's going on there. I've got the participant window up and then the chat window below. And that way I see who's got their video and audio on and I can follow the chat. So it all fits on the same screen. So know that when I'm sharing my screen like I am right here, I've got all your photos um, on my other screen. I work off of two screens. So just know when I say nod your head, I'm looking at your faces. So, but, but I just wanted to show you what the layout is um, because I've done a lot of zooming in lots of different ways and this setup um, has worked well for me and perhaps there are other ways that have worked well for you. But I just wanted to make sure you saw this so that you realize there's an easy way to do these things. So um, in general, as far as Zoom, I expect that you would show your camera during most of class time. Um, that, you know, if you got a comment or clarify a question and I realize it's the first class, so you're all being quiet or you're exhausted from your day today. Um, but if you want to talk, just jump in or just show me your hand. I don't really like the raise your hand feature in Zoom because I, I don't watch it. Um, but I do watch the chat. So that's where, you know, if you agree with something, if you want to do applause to somebody for doing something, that would be the place to put it, clarifying questions, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, there's times we all have to step away from our, our, our computers or, you know, we got kids at home and they need their our attention. So just, you know, turn off your audio and video and that's fine. And the other thing I want to remind all of you is, you know, you can, if there are times where you're going to be on the road or you can't make it, remember, you can just dial a phone number and you can still be part of this. Um, so I, I don't know that there's many reasons for you not to, quote, attend our class. Now, I realize there are things, but, you know, even if you're driving, you can um, join and listen in even if you can't see everything. Um, and, and then the other thing, Oh, where did I do that? Oh, I guess I'll mention it here. So you'll always see me with a headset on. And I do that partially because then I really can hear the sounds really well. But also, I know that none of the sounds going on in my house are heard by any of you because I have a headset. Now, maybe your house is always really quiet. Um, mine generally is too, but there's other noises that bother me. So if you don't have a headset yet, um, it's probably something to invest in in the future because for me, it keeps out all the noise. And I know this microphone works. I know what I'm recording, people can hear my voice. So there's never any question about that. So, so just so you know that. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about this and then I'm gonna stop my sharing and we're gonna go from there. So hopefully you made your bingo board. So here's the way this game works. So I'm gonna put you in Zoom rooms. So there's about three or four people in, in each room. Let's see, there's 18 of us, four. Yeah, so I'll do, I'll do um, well, you'll see which room you're in. Anyway, I'm gonna put you in a random Zoom room. You will have five minutes in the room to figure out who has the answers to these questions. And, and then I'm gonna call you all back in and then I'm gonna mix you all up and put you in another breakout room. And depending on the time, I might do that a third time. Your goal is to get as many bingos as you can on your bingo board. Now I'm gonna click on the bingo board here and you can see mine on my screen. And you can do your bingo board in several ways, right? You can, you know, you could just highlight things if you want and use that, or you can put a check on it or whatever works. Note that the middle box, you can right now type an interesting fact about anyone. You could put it for yourself. Know that you can have the same person on two different boxes if you want. But these are the questions to ask like, um, in fact, I will give you this one. If you, on the one that says whistle, you could put my name down for can whistle because I can whistle. So you can see other things here that, that you can fill in. As you get into your, in your groups, then um, depending who's in your group, you'd say something like, hey, Aurora, do you like to cook? And Aurora might say yes, or she might say, no, not really. Well, then you can't write Aurora's name down there, right? Um, or you might say, hey, Denise, do you, can you use chopsticks? And Denise says yes, then I would go down here and I put Denise's name down here. So I have their name down there. 
Again, your goal is to get as many bingos as you can. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now and see if there's any questions. And so normally, if there aren't any questions, I'm gonna assume you know what you're doing. Um, I would have expected that you'd put some stuff in the chat room if there were problems with that. So again, you're gonna have five minutes in your breakout rooms to fill in as many of those boxes as you can. I'll send you the one minute warning and then we'll go from there. So let me think about this a minute. Okay, that's what I'll do. Okay, just had to figure out how many verses. Oh, before I do anything else. All right, everybody, welcome back from the break. Again, I wanna just share our class norms here and then share that I'm gonna talk a little bit about these areas, my expectations, um, assignment due dates. Um, you'll have a three week grace period. You'll hear me say that over and over. If uh, you're not able to turn assignment in within that three weeks, that's where I'd like you to let me know. Um, things happen and I understand that. And as I know things are gonna get um, busy, especially around April, right before April 8th, right? That's when EdTPA is due for many of you. So um, know that iLearn has the most up-to-date information about assignments. So the syllabus, I think it's got the same dates, but you know, I put that together and then moved it to iLearn and then iLearn is the main document I use. So, but I used, I put my due dates in iLearn based on what was on that assignment sheet that you should have printed or downloaded earlier. So they should all be together, but when in doubt, check out iLearn. Okay, so first I wanna thank all of you for becoming a teacher. Um, it's, um, it's one of the greatest um, professions to be in. I had a great time doing all the teaching that I've done. Um, and um, so I hope that you find as much fun doing it as I did. The, um, so there's this quote here that I really like. It says, as vibrant beings, we each vibrate an energy into our learning environments. When these collective energies are activated and engaged, the learning becomes rich, meaningful, and provides a path to relevancy in our own lives. So basically that means that we all have a say in what's going on and your energy adds to my energy and all together we, we work well together. And that's kind of the key piece here. So I wanted to find some terms. There are terms that I use here. Um, again, as I'm going along, if something's not clear or something like that, please just uh, type in the chat room. So you all have online weeks where there's no Zoom class and then Zoom meetings, which we are having right now. So it just happened that the very first day of the semester is also our Zoom class. So this is our official start. Um, so I consider this a Zoom week. The following week's an online week. During online weeks, there is online work to do, a discussion board, which we'll talk more about. So iLearn is where all the course content is, is kept. When I say assignments, that's where assignments are turned in via iLearn. Sometimes they're just assignments for assignments. Sometimes assignments are turned in. Um, it just depends. Um, again, you've got a three week grace period, as I mentioned there. The digital binder, which I know some of you have started and I'm glad you have, is how we're gonna organize the content for this class. Um, that way it is, you always have that content I learn eventually will go away, but your digital binder will not unless you decide to delete it. Know that there's four times throughout the semester when I'm gonna check your binders to make sure it's up to date and has everything in there. Know that those digital binder checks are one of the ways that I just check to make sure you're moving through the course along with me, in addition to the assignments as you turn them in. Um, and again, during online weeks, there's a discussion board. Um, I want you to complete your initial post by Wednesday of that week and respond to at least two other people by Saturday. Now know that every time we have a Zoom class, the next discussion board will be posted. So if you wanna get a jump on that as soon as we're done with class or this week, you're welcome to, but during online weeks is our discussion board weeks. Now the discussion boards, those are the one thing that I want you to do on time. 
because a discussion board doesn't work very well if one person adds to the discussion board three weeks later. So those are always due during the online weeks or you can get a jump on it ahead of time. But I want everybody responding and being part of that discussion board. And you'll hear me talk more about that later. Um, and there are three assignments or three times throughout the semester where you're gonna reflect on what the discussion board reflections have been about. All right, so that's that stuff. So I just want to share with you my, my family. Um, so I'm the oldest of five kids. Uh, my sister's the youngest. You can see our all of our family here. Um, you can see my parents sitting in the front row. They've, they passed away nine and 10 years ago, but um, we were a family of seven growing up and together in the same house. We had a Volkswagen van because that was the only car at the time that would transport all of us at once. Uh, my grandparents, my dad's parents lived like a mile away from us and we would often spend Saturday mornings at their house watching cartoons because they were the first ones to have a color TV. So we enjoyed hanging out with our grandparents on Saturdays. So, you know, I grew up believing that my family was normal and I thought it was like every other family, right? We grew up in Santa Cruz. We went to public school every day. We played little league baseball or softball for my sister. In the evenings, my mom fixed the dinner and we all ate around the same table. Uh, dinner was always at six o'clock and you never wanted to be late. Uh, in our younger years, it seemed like at, during dinner, somebody would spill a glass of milk almost every dinner time. That was almost a common occurrence we got used to. On Sundays, us kids uh, would go to the Catholic church with my mom and my dad would go golfing. Um, in our family, we, we usually had a summer vacation each summer, at least one week, usually sometime in July or August. And usually it was camping. You can imagine a, a large family, you know, my parents, you know, could, with a large family, you could only do so much, but my mom loved camping. And so we would, we camped all over the state of California and at one point up into Oregon and Washington. Um, my dad insisted that our vacations would never be in the same place. In my family, we celebrated birthdays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter. We also celebrated religious events such as baptisms and first communions and weddings and funerals. And often those gatherings were attended by extended family members. People would drive in and fly in from other cities to be part of those events. Uh, when we got to the right age, um, we celebrated getting our driver's license at age 16 and registering to vote at age 18. Those were just some of the expectations in my family. Most of those were mostly guided and directed by my mom. I mean, my dad was a happy participant, but my mom was the one who really ran the house and was the one who um, made, it, made it a big deal to register to vote and to be involved in our community as much as we can. Both of my parents were involved in city government. Um, if you've ever been to Santa Cruz and seen, seen the town clock there, my dad was part of the group that helped build that clock. Uh, he was also a lawyer in Santa Cruz. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, but stayed active as a member of the League of Women Voters and a, a member of the city planning commission. Um, most of us boys, as I mentioned, there were four boys and then my sister, us boys all had paper routes at different times. We had a little extra spending money and so my parents insisted that we put some of that money into a savings account at our local bank. So we all had local bank accounts as well. After high school, we all attended college and we went to various places around California, right from high school to a four-year college. That was just expected in my family. So that's what we all did. Um, as I think back to my schooling and growing up um, in my experiences now, um, I realized that the first time I had a non-white teacher was when I went away to college. Um, most of my classmates growing up were mostly white. There were a few Latinx people and one or two African-American people, um, but it was pretty much an all white community. So that's what impacted um, my growing up years. I do remember my history classes. Um, the teachers mostly taught from the textbook and we would haul that big textbook in our backpacks from school to home and do homework. And often the homework was answering the questions at the end of the chapter. Um, in addition, as if, if I looked at the pictures in the textbooks, they were mostly pictures of white men and a few women. 
um, many of whom in the textbook did look like me, right? Because I'm a white male. Um, in my family, we actually learned that we're descended from Martha Custis, who is the wife of George Washington. So later in life, you know, we joked about Uncle George. Um, overall, I identify as a white European cisgender gay single male and dad. My pronouns are he, him, and his. My religion is Catholic, and I have a 31-year-old daughter. When I look in the mirror each morning, these are the identities that I see. It made my identity may depend differently on different days. Um, I still go to church every Sunday. In fact, I'm the church Zoom monitor there to help people connect with our church. In addition to these identities, I also have white privilege. And, you know, it's a bit uncomfortable for me to say that. Um, it took me a while to learn what white privilege and what that means. Um, you know, it's not a topic we ever discussed in my family. It was never a topic discussed in any of my classes. Um, but it's something that certainly is part of the culture that I've grown up in. Um, to me, white privilege means I'm not treated differently because of my skin color. I feel comfortable being in most situations and in most places. I haven't had a negative experience with a police officer aside from a, an occasional speeding ticket. Um, and I haven't had to talk to my daughter about the disparities that people of color have to face or how to act differently around the police. So this is a glimpse into my culture and the culture I grew up in. I share it with you because each of us have our own unique family culture. We each have our own definition of normal and each of us have our belief system about how we treat others and how we should be treated. Most importantly, the important part of all that is the way our beliefs and the way we grew up impacts how we teach school. The words we use, the actions we take are all connected to our families and how we grew up. That research is pretty clear if you read about it. Most teachers teach the way that they were taught in their families, in their schools or in their churches. Um, and it's important to realize that so that as we teach and work in our classrooms that that we do empower and include all of our all of our students, even if we haven't experienced them in the families that we grew up in or in the communities we grew up in. We don't want to teach negative stereotypes that many of us grew up with. Um, if you recall the online survey I asked you to complete, I asked you who impacted your decision to become a teacher. And many of you said other teachers, some of you said the, uh, the college programs you're involved in. Some of you said your parents. I became a teacher in 1975. And I can tell you it was my grandfather that influenced me because after my first year of college, I was having lunch with him. And he said, you know, you seem to like kids, you ought to become a teacher. And I hadn't really thought about that until he put that thought on my head. So then I pursued uh, getting my teaching credential. Uh, my first teaching job was teaching kindergarten. In every class I taught after that, there was some history or social studies included. When I taught kindergarten and first grade, the students and I would take voyages with explorers and sing songs about them. In second and third grade, we talk about our state and local officials and heroes, mostly white men and a few women. Sometimes our history books would include non-white people such as Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks or Cesar Chavez, but usually these individuals had one corner of one page of the textbook. When I taught fifth grade for Halloween, I'd have the students weigh and measure pumpkins for our math time. And then I would send those pumpkins home with some of the students to freeze the pumpkin and then have their parents make pumpkin pie in November for our school Thanksgiving feast, which sometimes included students dressed as pilgrim and Indians. When I taught eighth grade, I had a song for every history unit I taught. It was fun getting eighth graders to sing along with me and my guitar. I taught them about the civil war and slavery and how the Civil War occurred to save the Union and free the slaves. I followed the textbook. And as I look back now, I perpetuated the white perspective and the white narrative of history. If I were teaching today, I would teach history in a much different way. I wonder how many of you went through school learning history the way I did from the white male perspective. 
when I became a teacher, we didn't have a class like this history social science program. Basically, I was handed the history textbook and said, teach it. And that's about as much as I learned about teaching history. Um, despite teaching history, I was always terrible at remembering dates and events. But there are some years in history I think are important for us to remember and to think about who was being persecuted because of them. So here's a couple I wanted to share with you. So on this screen, you can see 1492. And, you know, I don't know about you, but we always use the poem, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. But we never talked much about what happened to Native Americans after Columbus and other explorers landed on, the, on this land. In 1619, the first people became enslaved in America in the Virginia colony. And that began the enslavement of African-American people. <clears throat> That's not often written about in textbooks, um, but there's a whole program that was put together by the New York Times called the 1619 Project and the importance of marking that year. 1849 was the California gold rush, but with the gold rush, there was labor needed and the Chinese culture was oppressed and used for that purpose, as well as the Transcontinental Railroad. You may not know, but during those years from 1849 to about 1870 in California and th across the United States, immigration changed and limited the number of Chinese people that could immigrate and basically um, um, discriminated against the Chinese people who helped to build the California Gold Rush as well as the Transcontinental Railroad. During World War II, as many of you probably know, there was a Japanese internment. So Japanese people for no reason except based on the color of their skin and their ethnicity were put in internment camps. Um, we indirectly continued that in a different way in the 1950s. During that time period, um, many of us learned about the Red Scare, but there was also a Lavender Scare where LGBTQ people were persecuted and laws were passed against people who identified as LGBTQ. And in 2001, which many of you probably remember 9-11 and the attacks in the US, following those attacks, there has been an attack on people of the Muslim culture and different things happened during that. Um, so those are some dates and years to think about. That's a little history to think about as uh, we move forward in this course. Um, in the survey that you all took, I want to share your results. Um, 90, about 90% 90 of you have responded so far, far out of all my sections. Um, but of the people who did answer, I know that people in our classes like to surf and walk. Uh, there are some great artists that love to paint, draw, and sew. Um, there are musicians in our group. People like sports. Um, there are people who are who have been into cheer their whole life and are great cheer people. And there are people who are great at baking and cooking. So I asked you what you remembered from your history classes, and this is what you told me. Um, one person wrote, my 11th grade teacher crying while telling the stories of the victims of the Armenian genocide. Um, people said they learned about Thanksgiving, Native Americans, the discovery of America. Um, some people said, I don't remember being taught history in elementary or middle school. Some people remember how Americanized the education was. Uh, one person's grandfather was part of the Braceros program and they were excited to learn about it in class, but it was never covered. It wasn't in most textbooks. Uh, many people remember working out of the book. Um, a couple of people said, I always hated these classes. All I remember I had to do was memorize and memorize stuff for tests. Um, some people said, I remember the personality of the history teacher, but not the content. Um, and people also, several people said it was mostly the history of the US and Europe, and that it was taught mostly from the white man's version and glossed over a lot of the negative occasions throughout our history. So that's what you all said. Um, you talked about how the COVID and the pandemic is impacting you. Um, several of you said, the pandemic's preventing me from getting a full experience as a student teacher. And you're right, this is different. Um, yeah, for many of you, your entire teacher credential program has been online. Um, some of you are going, I don't even know what it's like to be in a classroom because you haven't had that experience. 
Um, some people struggle to find a quiet place where they can do their classwork. Um, some people said it's given them more time to do other things like creating art or making music. Um, some people aren't feeling comfortable leaving their house at this point and nothing feels normal anymore or we're trying to define what that is, right? <laughs> um, many people live alone um, instead of with friends because of the pandemic. Um, but it's good to know that everyone I care about is safe and that's all that really matters. Um, some of you said nobody that you know has um, contracted COVID and that's good. Um, and some of you said you, you miss having this active social life, um, but you found time to turn inwards and work on yourself. So, um, and um, so that's what you all said about that. Um, and then I asked you what you expect from this course. Um, I grouped things um, like I did up here. A lot of you said, I want to learn how to teach history, social science and make it fun, engaging, immersive and effective. Um, one person said, I didn't fall in love with history until college and I want to know how to help kids fall in love with history. Um, many of you pointed out that you want to break out of teaching history is only Eurocentric. Um, how to implement the history of brown, black, native, Asian Americans. Um, in following the curriculum and to be confident in doing that. Um, how to make it inclusive for all students. Um, you want meaningful history, social science curriculum. You wanna know how to engage and guide students. And some of you wanna learn a little history. So hopefully I've taught you a little history already today. You'll get lit bits and pieces along the way. Um, so I asked you what you expected from me. And several of you said you expect flexibility and understanding. Somebody said it this way, the pandemic and online learning is stressful. My personal schedule with distance teaching, taking care of my parents, watching family and a job makes it difficult for me to schedule everything in. So I hear you, I understand. Um, you want me to be organized, respectful, positive, supportive. Um, you hope that I can help you become a better teacher. And you hope that we have a fun interactive class where all voices are heard. Um, and I'll just add to that, that I hope that I'm inviting you into the conversation and that I do not do things <coughs> that exclude you from your voice being heard. And if I do, I hope you'll gently call me out about that. So I asked you, um, what do you have content knowledge of? So anything in blue and red, there's is people had lots of knowledge of. Um, anything in green or purple, there's a little, a little bit. <coughs> um, so there's lots of green and purple um, about African-American history, Asian-American history. European history is across the board, right? Because many of us grew up with European-American history. So there's a better understanding of that. Um, you can see again, the green and purple lines for LGBT history. Um, it looks like many of you grew up learning some Latinx, Mexican American history, um, not much Muslim American history or Native American histories across the board. Um, these are here because as you'll see in a future class, these are the types of history we should be teaching. Um, and these are the other histories, people with disabilities, world history, US American history. Again, you can see how those bars change with the content that most of us grew up taking. Um, and, and then I asked if you knew about the history of social science standards, the framework um, and the common core standards. And most of you said, you know a little bit about the common core standards. So orange was the middle of the road. So I'm glad to know you've heard about those because by now um, many of your schools and school districts, that's what governs how you teach and what you teach. Um, and then I, um, asked you if you knew how to write history social science lessons and some questions about teaching English learners. And again, teaching English learners and lessons for English learners, many of you said that you've had that experience and, and you feel pretty comfortable doing that. So that's good that you see that. So as I look across the people in this class from the interviews that we had that or the first meetings, the surveys, I know that there are various races and ethnicities. Now these are all assets. So I encourage all of you to think about your lived experience of growing up and think of how everything is a benefit to who you are today and how that will apply in your teaching. So um, 
Some people have been impacted by the fires in COVID-19. There's various cultures and language. Many of you speak two languages, something I wish I could do and haven't. Um, some of you are part of the LGBTQ community, some out, some are not. Some of you are gender fluid. Um, some are immigrants and non-immigrants. Some are documented or undocumented. Um, some people have experienced abuse or addiction. Um, some people have had lots of reading in the home. Some found their reading materials at the library. Some people have experienced homelessness or being a foster child. Um, some of you have lived in one place. Some of you have lived in many places, although most of you lived mostly in one place, I, as I learned. Um, so here's my beliefs about teaching. Students are first. I want to learn about students first. Content and pedagogy are second. Teaching is not a spectator sport. So if you're going into teaching to sit back and do nothing, this is not the career for you because you need to take active roles in, in teaching. Um, successful instruction is really about relationship building. So the more you get to know your students, the better you get to know how to teach. Um, and also there is no excellence in education if there is not equity. And equity has to do with treating all students in an equal way and reaching out to all students. All ethnicities, ELD, special ed students, LGBT students, all students are important. So keep that in mind. Also know that history social science easily integrates with English language arts or reading and writing. And in many of our schools, I know that History is social science is not a separate subject. And that's one of the things we'll talk about in this class. Um, keep in mind that the language and the words we use are important and it impacts our learning. Learn to, to ask the right questions because education is inherently about asking the right questions. Um, engage your students as co-learners because they have a lot to share when you ask the right questions. Adopt a growth mindset because every child can be successful. Every student can be successful. It's, it's just that, you know, every kid doesn't grow in the same process and they don't necessarily grow in the way that our school system says either. But keep that growth mindset in mind. Um, and keep in mind that every class you teach should be your ideal class. I can remember being in the teacher's lounge and people saying, oh, just wait till you get this class of students. It's the worst class I've ever taught. That doesn't really help build empowerment for students when teachers say things like that. I've said this before, but I'll say it one more time that feeling uncomfortable about a topic is okay. It's an opportunity for further learning. Um, there should be a resource source that validates what and why you are teaching. Um, most everything I share with you will have a source and a date. So I consider myself a constructivist. A constructivist means that I can present things to you, but you construct, you construct your own learning and your own knowledge. Um, you have your own journey of learning. I can't create it for you. So know that I'm gonna present things to you, but it's up to you how you grab them and, and how you use them. You know, I can provide ideas and activities, um, but you're the ones who have to think about your journey in education and what it looks like. So I do view myself as a facilitator of learning, um, but, I like to believe I create space for your learning. And again, if, if I don't do that, I'd like to know. Um, so here's these basic expectations that I have of you is to be on time. I expect all of you to get A's or B's. Um, again, this is the last time I'm gonna say this, but you have a three week grace period. I expect you to do every assignment. I wouldn't do those, make those assignments if I didn't think they were important. Do not skip any assignments. If you skip any assignments, that may result in a lower semester grade, but, um, but hopefully you won't do that. Um, so what to call me? So my first name is Rob. You're welcome to call me Rob or Dr. Darrow or Professor Darrow. Any of those are acceptable terms. Um, as again, as you heard me in our intro meetings, uh, communication is important to me. You've got my phone number. You can text me, you can call me, you can send me an email. If life happens, just let me know. Um, the exciting part of this broader cohort is there's two people who may have a baby during this semester of our class together. Um, it's our common opportunity, right, to imp impact our future history. Um, so 
I just want people to know that. Um, so consider this your opportunity that there are three sections that I'm teaching. So if you can't make one section, you can reschedule and come to a different class. Um, and you know we can do th some things all together as we go. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Now I do have some pet peeves I want you to be aware of. So if, if you're gonna quote a source, I really like to know the date of the source. It drives me crazy when people quote something and I don't know when it was written. I, pref I prefer Arial font 12 point. I don't like those curly cues things, but you know, for some of the more creative assignments, you're welcome to use those. Please spell your words correctly. Um, avoid, when you're doing presentations like this one, avoid dark letters on a dark background in PowerPoint, or you can see Google Slides where I intentionally type that in pink and you can see how hard it is to see. Um, there are some things I've given you a format for, like lesson plans and things like that. Please use the format I gave you. There's a reason for it, just use it. Um, I created several videos for you to help you be successful. Please watch those videos, um, even if you're doing something else at the time. Um, typing in all capital letters means people are shouting. So unless you intend to shout at me, please don't type in all capital letters. Um, if you get stuck or overwhelmed, please ask for help um, from your classmates or from me. Um, if you don't have a classmate support group yet, then I would encourage you to make one. Um, and then I have this overall request. Please don't make me chase you down. And although I'm happy to chase you down, to support you to be successful in this course and as a teacher. So here are things that may cause me to chase you down. If you don't participate in class and you don't volunteer, if you don't respond to my email in 24 hours, if you don't complete your assignments, um, if you don't do the discussion boards or you don't show up in class or you don't participate or you don't communicate with me about changes in your life, then those would be reasons for me to reach out to you and say, hey, what's happening? So, um, and I'm happy to do that, but I would encourage you to be proactive with me. And again, I know you're busy. I know you've got a million things going. Just a quick email to let me know that you're alive and well and you're working on things, that's great. So here's what this course is and is not. So this course is all about teaching history, social science, learning about the standards and the framework, how, to, how you will learn content knowledge. I'm gonna teach you how to learn the content knowledge, but I can't teach you all the history content. K through eight, that would be, you know, that's a whole history course in itself. Um, but we'll talk about how to write and teach history, social science lessons. We'll talk a little bit about implicit, bi implicit bias, about um, race, ethnicity, how those integrate in. And most importantly, hopefully you learn more about yourself because the first big assignment is all about figuring out who you are and why you're doing what you're doing. So just know this class is not a survey course to teach you US history or any other cultural content, although we'll touch on those. And the class in this class, I don't provide detailed practice or feedback about how to write or teach a history lesson, but I do help you learn how to write the lesson and you'll experience that and we'll share it back with each other. So that's what this class is and is not. So I think I'm gonna skip this slide because I wanna move on to this Let's see. Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing because I wanna take a minute and look at our, um, I wanna look at our groups because I wanna make sure that our groups are balanced. And if some of you didn't sign up for groups, this is your time to do it. So uh, I'm going to the agenda and clicking on balancing the groups. So some of you are gonna to have to change some groups here um, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, so here's all these grade levels thing. Let's see, did, um, so, Nancy Bravo, what grade level are you teaching?
Nancy, can you unmute yourself and help me out here? Which Nancy? Nancy Bravo. Um, teaching co-teaching kindergarten. Okay, so I'll te add you to the, the kindergarten group, huh? Is that all right? So, so, the, so you all are going to be in a group and you're going to learn in depth the curriculum of one grade level here. Nancy, do you want to do kindergarten or do you want a different grade level? Kindergarten is fine. Okay. And this would be the time any of you, um, I'm assuming many of you signed up for the grade level you're in, but if you wanted to learn a curriculum at a different grade level, then this would be the time to say, I want to move to this grade or something like that. And even I'll give you a two week grace period. If you change your mind in two weeks, you can do it as well. Um, and then um, Marisol, what grade level are you, do you want to be in? Um, I think I put Kendra. Are you up? Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay, great. Um, is there anybody whose name is not on here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, 18. Oh, good. You're all here. Awesome. Okay. So um, those of you who are, are by yourself, it's not going to be very fun doing this by yourself. Um, because you really need to be in a group. So, um, so Pamela, do you want to, um, so a couple options here. So like in second and third grade, we can combine that to be a second, third grade group, or each of you, you could join the fourth grade group. So then you'd be a group of four. That might be the way to go. Um, Pamela and James, what do you think? Yeah, I could join the fourth grade. I'll go whatever, I'll do whatever you want to do. Whatever so, all right, so let's make this, so let's make this a second through fourth grade group. Um,